January 2020, the great Saturn-Pluto conjunction. You are a human, not a number. This report is being done on December 29th, 2019. Just so you know, moving ahead, this video will be composed of three distinct parts. The first part will be a general examination of the Saturn-Pluto conjunction. The second part will be a discussion of the lunar eclipse at 20 Cancer. And the last part of the video is the month ahead with just uh, bringing it back down to Earth and here and now in our personal life sort of approach to the aspects at hand. Now, um, this is for the Saturn-Pluto conjunction and the lunar eclipse, this is going to be a very superficial examination. If you want a much more in-depth look at this and an, 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 uh, a bit of an astrology lesson, it, the, the deeper more thorough examination of these things will be on video on my Patreon page. So for my Patreon subscribers, this will be made available to you for everybody else here on YouTube in order to keep this under 20 hours. We're going to make this as brief and kind of go over the high points as best we can. All right. The Saturn Pluto conjunction. The image that you're seeing is the Hierophant from the, the Rider Waite Tarot. The Hierophant is also the fifth member or fifth card in the major arcana lineup. The Hierophant in Tarot has everything to do with social approval, respectability politics, religion, church, religious authorities, spiritual leadership, also convention and conformity. The Hierophant in the Rider Waite Tarot has a lot to do with the social structures in our lives that bring and create and maintain social order. So power concentrated in the hands of a few people who uh, present themselves as the moral compass for other people is the Hierophant. One of the other things with the Hierophant is it's also a card of judgment. It's the person who holds court and passes or dispenses judgment on other people, which is different from the judgment that we see in Tarot, which is about the legal process. Um, this has more to do with social propriety and that type of judgment about whether we're okay or not. And the Hierophant is a reflection of how we're going to be experiencing the Saturn-Pluto conjunction. So for those of you who study the tarot um, or are familiar with it, this is a great time to take a look at the Hierophant and watch the Saturn-Pluto conjunction unfold and look at the deeper meanings and mysteries hidden inside the card. Because just like astrology, tarot has a lot of hidden meanings that are not openly broadcast um, and made readily available just to memorize. There are a lot of hidden mysteries and meanings and layers of understanding that only come with really understanding the art and science of astrology or tarot. So for those of you who are students of either, this is a great time to watch and follow along so you can deepen your understanding and appreciation of how we can expect this to play out and where those associations are. The Sabian symbol for the degree of the Saturn-Pluto conjunction will be a general accepting defeat gracefully. This has a lot to do with closing chapters in our lives and resigning ourselves to allowing progress in the future to happen and move forward. So the Saturn-Pluto conjunction has everything to do with ending an epoch, right? A major portion of time in civilization. We are coming to the end of an epoch right now. The Chandra symbol, uh, which is another form of um, degree symbolism, the Chandra symbol is a bare altar covered with black velvet. The Chandra symbol uh, here also describes um, a situation or circumstance of mourning and again repeating themes of ending or loss. So there are things that are being laid to rest and also in it, with the Chandra symbol, a bare altar covered with black velvet, and the Tarot Association of the Hierophant, there's also a strong suggestion of rituals, ritualistic things, systematic, systemic things. So there are structures and systems and rituals involved with that. Now, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. If you, if you guys have been following me any length of time, you know, you know I'm far from it. Um, but what I will say is this also suggests secret societies and secret orders, right? You know, the initiate orders of initiates. Um, this also suggests the possibility of 
magic or mystical rites um, and secret societies being used for good or ill, right? But all done under the shroud of secrecy. So all of these things are connected to the Saturn-Pluto conjunction. And again, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but with this showing up, there's definitely some significant powers and power players afoot that are members of secret societies or small elite groups of people who are possibly mourning or trying not to mourn, try actively fighting and resisting, trying to maintain their status quo because times are changing and there's a sense and a knowing that uh, those times are about to be over and past. Saturn and Pluto, rage against the machine. So I want to do just a little breakdown of the rulerships of Saturn and Pluto um, to kind of get your mind going, right? With Saturn, there's the, I'll just give you the list here. There's a list of keywords. This is not all of them. This is just some of them for Saturn and with Pluto. The most important things that I want you guys to recognize about the difference between the two of them and where the challenge is going to be is that Saturn always represents maintaining the status quo. Pluto always represents destruction of the status quo. And now we have these two opposing forces coming together and having to share the same space. They're literally tied at the hips to each other. So this literally the Saturn Pluto conjunction in terms of the systems and organizations of our lives and our, our worlds and realities, we know it and the things that keep the great machine running. Um, it could be anybody's game at this point, how this plays out. Like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs from Still I Rise by Maya Angelou. So if you haven't read that poem, I really recommend you read it. It's wonderful. And the reason I use that particular phrase from the poem, uh, one, because it's pretty awesome, but the other two is that Saturn and Pluto, surprise, also rules diamonds. So I don't know for sure, but I would, I would be tickled pink and not surprised if diamonds and uh, diamond money and diamond cartels and things that have to do with literally diamond mining um, somehow becomes a big issue, like a much bigger issue now than ever before. And this may play into this whole elite group, secret society sort of thing. I don't know what that's about. Um, but there it is. Now, Saturn and Pluto rules crystalline things of high value. So it's not just diamonds. It's all of your um, uh, gems, all of your precious gems, and specifically the ones that are of extremely high value for whatever reason. So these are the things that are really uh, being hyper-focused at this time and may be the very uh, pivot point upon which everything changes. So it will be interesting to see how that plays out. And again, here's a list of keywords for Saturn and Pluto. And I'm going to leave that there and we'll get into a lot of this in more depth on the Patreon page for the subscribers as an actual astrology lesson. I'm not going to drive you guys crazy here, um, but there it is. If you want to take a look at it. Oh, right. And the other thing. Um, so the suggestiveness of the quote from the still I rise poem by Maya Angelou, the other reason that it's there is because Saturn has a lot to do with bondage and restriction and oppression. Saturn is the thing that stops you from doing what you want to do. Saturn is the thing that says you will do what I want you to do, right? It's, it's literally being held captive or, or in bondage. Pluto has everything to do with things that are intrinsically valuable to us that we aren't necessarily able to name. So reproductive access and reproductive rights are very Plutonian things. Pluto rules the pregnant woman. The moon rules motherhood, but that gestational period from conception uh, or yeah, conception, right? When the, the egg is impregnated with a sperm to the time the actual labor and delivery occurs, that is Pluto. That is so Pluto. So, uh, it was appropriate that this this image of diamonds at the meaning of her thighs, right? This thing of tremendous coveted value at the meaning of her thighs uh, also reflects Saturn and Pluto because it's not about her vagina. It is about controlling access to her ability to reproduce and who gives permission to her or anybody else to reproduce with her genetics 
or her as the vehicle for someone else's genetics. So that's what that's about. And more of that again in the, <laughs> in the astrology lesson. All right, so when we talk about absolute power and control, Saturn is control, Pluto is power, the two of them together are absolute, right? We're also talking about situations where we're coming to loggerheads again with maintaining the status quo versus destroying the status quo so that things can breathe and live and move forward. This, these are two pictures and they're here for a reason. So in 1989 in China, um, college students were protesting against the Chinese government. Now the Chinese government has not always been a communist government. It's only recently become a communist government in the last few decades. Um, but as a communist government, much like other communist governments, it's basically a dictatorship under the guise of communism, right? You know, uh, communism, everything belongs to everybody except really everything belongs to everyone, but it really belongs to me because I'm in charge and I get to decide who gets what. So um, communism, as a rule, not socialism, communism has never yielded good results. And Russia is a classic example of it because they've been doing it longer. Anyway, um, there was a group of college students in Tiananmen Square that were protesting. It was a huge protest and the Chinese government sent the military in and literally massacred these kids in the square. It was a horrific bloodbath. Um, and one that should not, has, has not been and should not uh, be forgotten and horrified the entire globe. Um, and just so you know, this is not unusual. Back in the 60s, there was the Kent State Massacre where our government did the same thing. They sent in the National Guard who then proceeded to mow down college students who were protesting, unarmed college students. Same thing as Tiananmen Square. It's just that Tiananmen Square was much more volume. There were much more, many more people involved. Now, Fast forward to 2019, and this is the Hong Kong protest. So one of the things I want you to notice right here, because you can't, you may not be able to see it too clear from where you're at. This, these are the police, right? This, all of this, these are the people. The Hong Kong protests are so huge that literally these bodies of people are filling the streets compared to this tiny, uh, like, you know, amount of people acting as the police force holding back. So this is absolutely a description of maintaining the status quo versus destroying the status quo and status quo. And remember, Pluto also rules the masses. Saturn rules the elite few, but Pluto absolutely rules the masses, large groups of people. So this is a classic image uh, and situation with the Hong Kong protests of Saturn and Pluto coming, having conflict. And absolute power and control will not tolerate any challenge or criticism of its behaviors or policies. So when we talk about Pluto and Saturn and Tiananmen Square and the Hong Kong protests, of course, we're going to pull up the chart for China, or, and more specifically, the most recent chart that I can find for the communist version of China, the People's Republic of China, which is the communist government that took effect back in 1949. Okay, and in this chart, I want you to, I want you to pay attention. So right here, we have a Mars-Pluto conjunction in Leo. So even without using the sign, just a Mars-Pluto conjunction, the things you should know about Mars-Pluto, anything, um, whether it's an individual or a nation or a government, um, Mars-Pluto, Mar mm, Mars is war, combat, aggression, um, testosterone, muscles, fire, heat, cutting. Mars is the impetus that drives things to move forward. So, uh, when you add Pluto to that mix, Pluto is going to intensify and exaggerate and take it to the nth degree. So for those of you who have never heard this term, the nth, sorry, handwriting, the nth degree is like, for instance, the ninth degree, right? Or the 10th degree. Um, and what we're saying is we're, at, when something is taken to the nth degree, we're taking it to the the ninth, tenth, eleventh, 
got, we're literally, we're going well beyond the bounds of reasonable at this point. So with Mars Pluto energy, what you have is someone or something that is capable of extreme amounts of endurance and power and will. Um, and also cruelty because they will take things to excess. They will not uh, submit, surrender, or, or, or give up. It's not their nature. So a Mars-Pluto conjunction is all about the exercise of power, the use of it, the abuse of it, the harnessing of it, the managing of it, and the acquisition of it. So this is what's happening as part of the natural chart for the communist version of government in China. So with that said, it's not unthinkable that they really do not tolerate any criticism of their government, even by their own youth. Okay. So there's that. Now, um, we're going to come back to this, but I just, this is highlighted because there's something very special about that Saturn in Virgo. I want you guys to see, um, and we'll, we'll get to that later. All right, I'm putting this here because I'm not letting anybody off the hook. This is not, with the Saturn-Pluto conjunction that we're dealing with and the stuff going on that's that's heating up uh, for this year ahead, nobody's getting off the hook. Um, and it's because I love you all and I want to be here on the planet that, that I can live on next year and the year after that I'm going to make sure we're all aware and on the same page with us. Dehumanization, that's a very important word and that's also a very possible thing with a Saturn-Pluto conjunction because Saturn likes to put things in little boxes and compartmentalize. Pluto has the ability to hyper-focus on something and eliminate all other associations with it. So, uh, for instance, when you have the Mars-Pluto conjunction, Mars doesn't compartmentalize. Mars just does, right? But Pluto allows that Mars energy to shut out every other consideration around, beyond, and over the goal ahead of it. So if their desire, as an example, if you were in war and you were a prisoner, Mars, Mars would probably beat you and hope that eventually you'll, you'll tell like it's, they're not, it's, they're very simple creatures uh, or planet. It's a very simple planet, Mars. When you do a Mars Pluto conjunction, you now go from uh, like barbaric waterboarding and beating people with sticks and rubber hoses into bamboo shoots under the fingernails, you know, put, putting people in the, like Chinese water torture, all those forms of torture that the Asians are known for, right? That we heard stories about from Vietnam. That's Mars Pluto. Mars has the ability to shut out all other aspects of your humanity and focus on the goal at hand and dehumanize you because it's hyper-focused on this thing, this very specific thing about you. So this is why dehumanization is very important because Saturn likes to put things in boxes, little neat compartmentalized boxes, and that's it. Shuts, shuts the thing, throws the key away, and it's done with you, right? The two together uh, really created a dehuman dehumanization or impersonalization that's very, very easy. Unfortunately, this may be coming from leadership because they are in the sign of Capricorn. Uh, we've been seeing this building and building and building, and this is what we are fighting against. So let's go, let's revisit it really quick. Uh, especially for those living in the United States that have not had to deal with any type of civil unrest since the 60s. Remember this come election time. When we turn our attacks onto our own youth and vulnerable women in their reproductive years, we have seriously lost our way because youth and reproductively viable women symbolize hope and the future. When we're attacking hope and the future, it means that we have basically hijacked everyone around us and we're taking them on our suicide mission because we don't see a future worth protecting. Uh, just as a reminder here in the US, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, remember Sandy Hook? It was not a hoax. Um, and the NRA, uh, you know, adults going after attacking teenagers who are trying to do the right thing. And it's the same thing with this orangutan going after this poor girl who's on Time magazine because anyway, so this is this is literally the the world that we are living in here in the US and this is not okay. So we're gonna end this Saturn Pluto discussion with this. Um, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Now this is a, a 
excerpt from a Bible quote, but it was used by Abraham Lincoln uh, during one of his campaign speeches. And it's a very, very important reminder to all of us that we, the only way any of us are going to survive and get through this and leave behind anything worth leaving behind for our children or our grandchildren is if we work together. Other people's presence does not make you invisible. You're still here. You still matter. We've all got to come from our strengths and pitch in. And you can't do that when you keep saying it's us against them. So this is the chart for China again, <clears throat> and we, we've discussed the Mars-Pluto connection in their chart. One of the things that I thought was interesting are some of the other connections to Iran and Russia. So why these countries instead of any other country? And the connections between the chart are pretty revealing as well. So we know that Russia has Jupiter at this degree. Jupiter, they have Jupiter at 14 Virgo. That's Russia. And Iran has Saturn at 12 Virgo. So Iran shares a similar Saturn placement to China. And in many ways, they're, they're similar. They're, they're both very <clears throat> uh, not interested in having outsiders in their world, as it were. Um, also, one of the things that I thought was interesting, so we know the moon, give or take a few degrees, um, is going to be in early Aquarius in this chart for the People's Republic of China. And look at this. That moon is also on the degree or near within orb of the degree for Saturn for the Russian chart and uh, Mercury, Mars, and the Sun in Iran's chart. And again, China and Iran have much more uh, of an affinity and a sympathy for each other than they do with Russia. So Russia uh, is a bit of <clears throat> what is the word I'm looking for? Um, a, a necessary evil for China. And here's the chart for Russia. So in Russia's chart, again, we see this connection to their Saturn. So Russia's Saturn is here, and the moon in China's chart sits on that Saturn degree, and Mercury, Mars, and Sun for Iran also sit at that degree. Now here, just want to point something out. Here, these planets are sympathetic to each other. So China and Iran have uh, many similarities and they get along just fine. Saturn is always an uncomfortable position no matter what you do with it. So neither one of these countries are uh, wildly or madly in love or trusting of Russia. <clears throat> and the fact that Russia's Jupiter sits dead on the Saturn for both of these countries um, only confirms or, or uh, exacerbates the level of suspicion about dealing with Russia, period. So there's a bit of an antipathy there uh, between, these, between China and Iran and Russia as the third wheel. So it's interesting that the three of them are now coming together for military operations. Um, so they must have a common goal because there's no other indication of sympathy between China and Iran versus Russia. Also too, the only thing we did find that was similarly compatible is that China's Venus is at the same degree, within a couple degrees, as Russia's Venus. Um, so in terms of their ability to cooperate and find compromise um, and operate or negotiate business deals, they would be on the same page. They understand each other in that respect. However, Iran's Uranus is right here. So Iran's relationship with Russia just on this alone is going to be unstable at best um, and certainly not long term. Now, with Russia, one of the things that I also want to point out is that here they carry a Venus Pluto conjunction, right? So, with China, they have a Mars Pluto conjunction. So, their desire and efforts to dominate and control and um, basically uh, force their agendas on other people and, and make other people do what they want to do, that Mars behavior, including military action and disciplinary efforts, um, would be very overt or out in the open. Like China won't, China doesn't hide it, even though we don't see it here because we don't have access to those news outlets, they're not sharing that information with us. It doesn't mean that they're hiding it from their own people. So 
people who live in China are very, very aware of how things are handled. Uh, and they're handled in the extreme to the nth degree. Um, and absolutely, it's all about maintaining order and control with the leaders, maintaining positions of leadership and staying in power over top of other people, um, which is a large part of why Hong Kong is in such outrageous protest about extraditions back to China. It's a lot more going on over there than just that. And, you know, the cry for democracy, it's, it's a long, very interesting story that has a lot to do with corruption and abuse of power, very Pluto themes. But back to Russia. So with Russia, they carry Venus Pluto together. So, and they're in Scorpio. So Venus and Pluto together uh, is about psychological warfare. It's not, it's not about physical warfare. So covert rather than overt. With Venus Pluto conjunction in Scorpio, what you're going to have is somebody who's very much about sabotage and uh, covert or, or uh, under the radar sort of operations. This heavy emphasis of Scorpio and Pluto in the chart and with Venus and its fall in that sign also indicates social criminal networks. So <clears throat> a lot of what this would represent is a heavy investment in antisocial or criminal behavior. And criminal behavior is antisocial behavior. It's the same thing. So there's that. With this, what I would look for, so let me give you an example of what I'm talking about so we understand what's happening here. So with Mars-Pluto conjunct, what you're going to have is somebody who will defiantly get in your face, and, and like if this were a, a woman, for example, who would defiantly get in your face, snap her fingers in your, literally in your face and say, oh no, I'm going to have your man. And then in front of you, <clears throat> daring you to respond, proceed to uh, flirt with, engage, seduce, and otherwise try to take your man out in the open, like not trying to hide this from anybody. <clears throat> Venus, Pluto, and Scorpio, on the other hand, um, or Venus, Pluto, is covert. It's under the radar. So Venus, Pluto is the woman who will pretend to be someone's best friend specifically for the purpose of breaking up the marriage and taking the husband and getting him, and then even turning the kids on, the, on against the mother or the wife. That's Venus, Pluto. And that's the difference between China and Russia. So China, and also too, China is, Mars is the military and young men. So based on the charts, China would appear to be, astrologically, in a better position to engage in actual combat, military combat. Because Mars and Pluto together, they will, literally like the kamikaze fighters from Japan back in the, one of the world wars, China will fight to the death. But with this level of organization and determination, um, and excess that Mars Pluto represents, they are formidable and they know it. So that's that's a little frightening to think about. Venus Pluto, on the other hand, with Russia, is not as strong in terms of a military force, but in terms of covert operations, they are far more dangerous because this is the bloodless kill. So this is the person who sets up booby traps and landmines like the the jungle fighters in Vietnam. There's all that stuff about that you don't see until it's too late. That's the way Russia goes about things. So the two joining forces, Russia and China, is not a good, it's not a good image, not a good image. It's kind of frightening when you, if, when you think about it. I don't know that much about the military or global politics um, and what little bit I do know and with what the astrology you know, this makes me extremely uncomfortable. Um, so, and here we have Iran. So what does Iran have to do with this? Well, I'm not completely sure. We'd probably have to look at the map or geography, but apparently Iran is a necessary uh, instrument in this or um, uh, a, a gatekeeper, as it were, for China and Russia. That, that's the only explanation for Iran being in this mix. So uh, this is an interesting thing. And remember, China is co overt, Russia is covert. So I would expect and especially with Russia's Jupiter all over China and around Saturn, I would expect Russia to have been the mastermind behind whatever is going on right now, because Jupiter sitting on somebody's Saturn tends to amplify their insecurity. So Jupiter or Russia and their Jupiter on the Saturn of both China and Iran. Okay, Jupiter has the advantage. So, and Jupiter knows how to play on those insecurities, especially with the Venus Pluto conjunction. So, ugh, yeah, fun times, fun times ahead.
And now we have Iran. So, so far with China and Russia, we've seen heavy Pluto contacts, right? So with China, it was a Mars-Pluto conjunction, and we've seen uh, the level of hyper-focused discipline and, and aggressive action they're capable of taking overtly out in the open. Uh, their Tiananmen Square massacre is a classic example of how overtly or obviously it out in the open um, dominating they're capable of being when it comes to the government's agenda, right? And the people in authority and leadership's agenda. Um, with Russia, we have a Venus-Pluto conjunction in Scorpio. So the same domineering will and desire to control and manipulate and, and enslave people is still there. But because it's Venus conjunct Pluto, it's much more underhanded. Venus and Pluto is the, uh, as an example, Venus and Pluto is not the woman who openly flirts with your husband at a party or, you know, is clearly trying to vamp it up to get all the attention, you know, from the man and suck the oxygen out of the room. Venus Pluto is the woman who pretends to be your best friend because what she's actually trying to do is break up your marriage so she can take your husband and then does. And, and then turns your kids against you. That's Venus and Pluto and Scorpio. So a nation having Venus and Pluto and Scorpio, there's a tremendous uh, affinity and undercurrent of underworld criminal elements in there, um, as well as much more subtle psychological manipulation because Scorpio is psychological manipulation. Pluto is propaganda, which is psychological manipulation. Oy. Okay, so, and now we come to Iran, the third of this trio, this, the, was it the three amigos or, 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 um, that met up for a cruise vacation in the Gulf of Oman to practice war games um, mm, as a joint players on a team. So when we're looking at the Iran chart, um, and this is set for uh, when the Ayatollah, I, 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 <laughs> the I, 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 when the Ayatollah Khomeini came into power in 1979. One of the things that we see, we don't really see anything obvious here, right? So we've got a Venus-Neptune conjunction, which is kind of weak. Like that doesn't really do much, right? Except with a Venus-Neptune conjunction in Sagittarius, it does make people xenophobic. Like they're very afraid of foreigners, um, which makes sense because the Ayatollah Khomeini came into power and the first thing he did was shut off all communication and and uh, indications and suggestions of the Western world. He wanted the rest of the world, all those damn foreigners, shut out of the consciousness of his country. Um, so that was pretty uh, evident. We're looking at that. But we're thinking like Pluto, right? So, well, here's the thing. They've got a moon-Pluto opposition. So with that, one, the moon is going to be uh, more or less around, and it's still a wide opposition, because the moon in this chart is seven degrees, Pluto's at 19, that's pretty wide. However, the sun and the moon, we're gonna give much greater orbs to because their light covers a much greater distance and they're much more vital in a chart. So Iran is still, in terms of charts and global politics and, and global strength based on the astrology or the cosmography that we're dealing with, is still a weak player. Um, and I'm not completely convinced that Iran still wants anything to do with the rest of the world. So this may all be a petty grudge for them, you know, the big F you to the United States or <clears throat> whoever it is that they are targeting with their military war games with China and Russia. Um, so beyond that, beyond this momentary inclusion in some type of exercise in the big, you know, F you sort of uh, thing, flipping off, you know, the global bird. Um, I don't imagine that Iran is going to work much harder at being any type of global superpower or getting involved with the world. They literally want to be left alone and away from everybody else. They're more interested in keeping their women and their culture hostage than they are actually doing other things that involve rising up in the ranks sort of stuff. That's for China and Russia to battle out with, which um, frankly is us because we're the other superpower. Um, they are rising. Russia has nothing and is trying to accumulate something because they're so poor. China has been building and building and building and focused on economic domination for generations. They are really somebody to worry about. Um, and we are the great titan, you know, that is now in a weakened, compromised state and they can smell the blood from, you know, miles away. So there you go. That's what we got on the playing field um, in case you missed it and you missed that headline. 
under the eclipse that we just had December 26th. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. What's that? You didn't you didn't see that headline? Well, probably because we're in the United States drowned under the sound of this cacophonous talking head pamelum that's about the impeachment, the impeachment. I'm so sick of hearing about this damn impeachment. Um, and it's literally drowning out all the other headlines, which maybe specifically for reason, largely having to do with trying to not set the entire public into a panic. But here's what you need to know, and it's all over the internet, so you can look for it if you need to. On December 27th, China, Russia, and Iran gather together to hold joint naval exercises in the Gulf of Oman. Yes, a four-day-long joint naval drill in the Gulf of Oman with China, Russia, and Iran acting as one coordinated team unit. You think about that. So, uh, and as if this wasn't enough, if this wasn't insomnia inspiring enough, this activity occurred under the auspices of the solar eclipse we had at Fort Capricorn on December 26th, 2019. So, I'm not saying to panic, but mm, I am saying that now would be a good time to start paying attention and to stop kidding ourselves. Remember, for you folks who live in the United States, uh, this is an election year coming up. Vote sensibly. The future that we're moving into is not ours. It belongs to our kids and our grandkids. And if we continue to play these games where we stick our head in the sand and we keep entertaining ourselves with these ridiculous conspiracy theories, right? You know, oh, the pedophile ring out of the basement of a pizzeria. Oh, the emails. Oh, oh my God. Anyway, uh, sure. If you keep doing that, like you're going to get exactly the future you've earned for yourself, Saturn, Pluto, um, because you are more interested in entertaining yourself rather than educating yourself like properly. So there you go. I'm just saying, just saying, I, I kind of like to be here and, you know, long as see my grandkids living on a planet that's worth living on. All right. All right. Next slide. So, um, Aside from, you know, the obvious issues with these countries, here's something else that I found very, very interesting. So why these, I mean, they're certainly not the only people on the globe that are not loving us right now, but why them, right? And and so who is, and the other thing too is when if you have more than one person involved, like which one is the leader, which one's the follower, right? So, you know, and this isn't, so a couple of things. One, I'm using charts that I am uh basing my confidence on that they're as close to accurate as possible. Um, also, <laughs> uh, these times could be off and there's always uh, some question about which one is the accurate or correct time for a national chart. So take this with a bit of a grain of salt, but it, even with that, this is pretty interesting. So one of the things that I found when I was looking at this, I thought this was amazing. So if we look at Russia, right? Russia has Jupiter. Russia has Jupiter at 14 Virgo, okay? Well, guess what these other two countries have around that degree? Hmm. Well, China has Saturn at 13 Virgo, and Iran also has Saturn at 12 Virgo. So Russia's Jupiter connects with both China and Iran's Saturn or Iran. So you might be asking yourself, well, okay, what the heck does that mean, right? Well, <laughs> um, I'm not going to get too much into it here, but I will say that Jupiter tends to act as an ameliorating or healing force and also a bit of a troublesome aspect because it will literally uh, blow open and exaggerate any issues that are there. So Jupiter-Saturn conjunctions between charts of individuals um, is very significant and uh, very dependent on all the other aspects in a horoscope. Uh, in the charts of national horoscopes, it's not any less important. So I thought it was very interesting that both China and Iran has Saturn and Virgo in their charts and Jupiter has or Jupiter, Russia has their Jupiter at the exact same degree. So I'll talk more about that in the, the lesson part of this, but I, I just want to point that out because that was an interesting 
no right okay the january 10th 2020 eclipse at 20 cancer so this is a fascinating chart that's much more interesting than i thought it would be but now that i've gotten into it it looks pretty pretty interesting so things to keep in mind with this eclipse as this eclipse is happening at the same time uranus is stationing direct these two together are a recipe for something completely earth shattering happening well maybe not earth shattering it's kind of not what we want to hear right now but certainly it explosive unexpected ground shaking ground shaking is a better word so <laughs> um, the eclipse with Uranus stationing direct is literally the recipe for something ground shaking so we may see actual ground shaking um, or volcanic eruptions or political eruptions or all it's it, honey it's anybody's guess at this point it's literally anybody's game now um, mm, this particular eclipse on top of everything else because it just couldn't get any we couldn't turn the the what is it the flame on the stove up any higher no no let's crank it up a couple more degrees yes this eclipse will also involve saturn pluto exactly conjunct at 22 capricorn so this particular eclipse is going to pull in the sun obviously because it's the eclipse mercury saturn and pluto um mm, 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 mm. oh fun times fun times this is going to be huge so what does this mean well it could mean any number of things and i'm not going to speculate or make predictions about anything specific but what i will say is that we should all be very mindful of our travels and our interactions with people for at least three or four days the three or four days immediately before the eclipse and certainly you know 24 to 48 hours after the eclipse because this is going to be huge right now the other thing are some little tidbits in here so in this eclipse chart the moon and saturn are the only planets with any strength in this chart i thought that was interesting as well um, the moon is in its rulership so is saturn the upside to this is that with those two planets in rulership we have the opportunity to get the best out of this so there may be remember uranus is about breakthroughs so uranus station direct may literally open up the floodgates to to let a whole bunch of things move forward finally that you know have been held back uh and and in reserve right could be good could be bad if it's good it's going to be great if it's going to be bad it's going to be terrifying um with the moon and saturn both in their rulerships it gives us the opportunity to pull the best out of these possible situations and remember saturn and capricorn at its highest manifestation and expression is about wisdom and legacy and standards highest possible executive standards we can have it's about doing the right thing the golden rule comes under saturn's domain so we may have some really outstanding positive things that are finally being released like doves at a wedding on this day so cross your fingers and focus on the good stuff now also uh this eclipse will be occurring in a pluto decanet which of course is more underworld eruptions more shady background stuff more power mongering so it's all about power these days unfortunately um this particular eclipse will also be occurring in the duodamsha of, of uranus but also saturn right so because saturn and uranus it's aquarius duodamsha and aquarius modern ruler is uranus it's ancient ruler saturn so in either event this is still a huge because the decanate remember let's look at this the decanate that this eclipse is occurring under is pluto right the the the, 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 the duodamsha all right is aquarius which is ruled by saturn and uranus so saturn is conjunct that pluto as part of this eclipse pattern and uranus is also stationing direct at the same time this is a time of significant portent so i am uh, anticipating and dreading what will pop off with this particular planetary activity so um get your popcorn get your tea get your wine get your beer uh, and find someplace safe and comfy with people you like to spend time with um, and let's see what unfolds the Sabian symbol for this particular eclipse is 
Venetian gondoliers giving a serenade. This Sabian symbol speaks to seduction and romance and the uh, un unwrapping of a gift, the unrolling of a story, the long process of pulling someone in by soothing them and calming them first. So what we may find is that we are basically being given a song <laughs> and a dance about what's happening um, because we are being manipulated into a false sense of security or comfort. So don't don't believe everything you're hearing around this time, especially if it's meant to placate you. Okay, so one of the big things is people really want to avoid panic in streets um, panic and pandemonium because that would be even messier and much harder to contain. So um, there's that part. The Chandra symbol for this ecliptic degree is many brightly colored tropical fish. Now, uh, in case you didn't know, the fish represents wisdom. <laughs> um, the fish also represent spirituality, right? And things that are well above and beyond our petty ego concerns here on, here on the planet in this incarnation. Many brightly covered tropical fish suggests exotic things and different things and diversity. So if you've ever had a saltwater fish tank or seen one, you know that the ecosystem in a saltwater environment and certainly a saltwater fish tank um, is comprised of diversity. Many diverse things are there and they all need each other. They serve different functions, but they all exist better when they're all there together, right? So it's not one thing, it's many things that create a functional ecosystem. So the many brightly colored tropical fish of the Chandra system may also be speaking to the wisdom and experience that is available from many diverse sources that work better when they're all together, right? Not homogeneously one of, of or many of one thing, but diverse groups of everything, right? And we have the fixed star Castor. Castor is one of the twins um, in the, the Zodiac. It's an interesting sign. And let me pull this up for you. So, and you can look it up too. I'm not gonna hold you to this. So there are two, there are two twins, Pollux and Castor. Castor, Castor, <laughs> um, is mercurial. It gives a keen intellect, success in law, many travels, fondness for horses, sudden fame and honor, but often followed by loss of fortune, disgrace, sickness, trouble, and great affliction. Um, the thing about Castor is that the difference between Castor and Pollux is that Castor has, is more, what is it? Mm. Castor is more argumentative. <laughs> and uh, certainly they're both mischievous, but Castor is more prone to uh, getting into the mix with people, you know, uh, fisticuffs. Um, there's a lot of energy in here. And also with Castor, there's an association with the, the twins, Castor and Pollux, with the eyes. So things that affect the sinuses, the eyes, vision, um, could be something that comes up as prominent today. So smoke, uh, tear gas, dust, dust particles, particles in general, things that, that um, chemical warfare, but specifically things that irritate the eyes and the sinuses may be a thing at this time as well. All right, so uh, I'm going to leave that at that, but we've got a heck of an eclipse happening. Now, if you have planets, bring it back down to Earth here. If you have planets at like 20 degrees of the cardinal signs, Aries, Capricorn, Libra, Aries, Can mm, Aries, Libra, Cancer, Capricorn, right? If you have planets at these degrees, you're absolutely going to be feeling this eclipse. If you have planets in the early degrees of fixed signs, Taurus, Scorpio, Leo, Aquarius, anywhere around two or three degrees, give or take a few degrees. Um, you're also going to be feeling this eclipse because Uranus was stationing direct and pulling in the Dwadamsha of the eclipse is going to really uh, set off your chart as well. So in our personal lives, we may be given some shocks uh, to deal with. 
And I can't tell you how it's going to work out one way or the other, but I can tell you it won't be easy, might not be pleasant, um, but it will be very important. And if you embrace and are open to assistance and wisdom and support from many outside sources, not just the ones you're familiar with, but embracing the world around you and all its beautiful, strange manifestations and the people in it, you may find you get exactly what you need to get the job done and to get things taken care of. So just also of note with this particular eclipse at 20 Cancer, I, I brought this up. I thought this was interesting. So the, the country to watch is actually going to be not the United States, but the United Kingdom, because if this is the correct chart for Britain, they already carry a full moon. Their moon is at 20, 19 Cancer. So they are taking a, an exact conjunction of this eclipse to their moon. So they may have a uh, member of the royal family that leaves the royal family, either advocates, passes on, or something. Um, so there should be some significant activity with the royal family uh, around this time. And I don't have the royal family's chart, so I haven't checked to see who it might be or anything like that. I don't want to speculate about that. Um, but it could also absolutely be with the country itself and the people because the moon rules the populace the sun rules the leaders so there may be some i can't even imagine what that would be but there may be something significant going on with the populate the general population during this eclipse uranus is stationing direct at three taurus which in their chart is going to be right here and that three Taurus, um, mm, that three Taurus station is going to pull in their Jupiter. So their Jupiter in this chart is in the tenth house. So this may be a, an issue, something explosive that involves the government um, or the leaders or the heads of state, which all goes back to political stuff. Um, so we'll see. The Jupiter also. Jupiter typically rules the foreigners because Jupiter is the ninth house planet. However, Jupiter is in Leo retrograde. So this may be a domestic issue, not a foreigner issue. So there may be attacks on foreigners at this time, or there may be attacks uh, by domestic parties from Great Britain on the government. Um, or they could be foreigners, uh, you know, doing something stupid again. So we'll see. We will see. But the United Kingdom under this particular eclipse, these are the ones to watch. Sorry, Great Britain. And here's the United States of America in our chart. So we're kind of almost feeling it. And the thing with the United States is there's so much contention around which chart to use. So I didn't pull up the Constitution chart, um, and I probably should have used that instead. But this is the Sibley chart, and this is typically what most people use, right? So I just use this. And with the Sibley chart, we're carrying a Mercury-Pluto opposition, all right, and the eclipse is right here at 20 Cancer. So it's four degrees out, but remember the sun and moon get much wider orbs because they are vital um, and have a much larger luminescence than the other planets. So they get a bigger uh, spread of degrees to work with. So we're technically taking it as well, but not nearly as urgently or specifically as Great Britain is. So um, we will definitely be dealing with whatever they're dealing with. It's, it's kind of simultaneous. Um, so it will be interesting to see what happens. Now, the Uranus station at 3 Taurus is going to occur here. So Uranus is stationed at 3 degrees Taurus, and it is not doing anything. So in theory, well, I mean, so it's going to make a sextile to Venus, which isn't really enough to write home about. So... The Uranus station, in in theory, makes an out of sign square to Pluto. So again, more stuff. But with the out of sign square in this in this situation with Uranus station, what I would also look for are things that are coming sideways. So this may not be a direct attack on us, as much as um, what is that thing that they call it when you're when you're a bystander and you get the fallout from something else. Uh, collateral damage, right? So we may be experiencing collateral damage because of something else happening elsewhere. In this particular case, with that exact hit to Great Britain, I suspect it's going to be Great Britain uh, that we may be experiencing collateral damage from. So uh, we will see. And, it, you know, it may not be that bad. So don't panic. Don't, I mean, be aware, but don't panic. 
Um, and let's see how this plays out. And the thing we're all looking forward to after all that, the month ahead for the here, now, and every day. Hey, so after all of that, I am sure you could use some good news. Um, and surprise, luckily, I do have good news for you. I actually have some really nice news. So we're going to bring all this back down to earth right here in the here and now in our personal lives where we have to live while we understand that there are bigger things that at play that we do need to be aware of. So here's your deal. This month is actually on a personal note, a very good month. It's going to be romantic, optimistic. You're going to have a renewed sense of purpose in a really meaningful, committed way. So people who make resolutions this year may actually keep them for more than two months. <laughs> um, but there's a, a real sense of urgency and uh, a, need, a desire and a need to be taken seriously but mostly for us to be able to take ourselves seriously in terms of what we're committed to. So that in and of itself is a pretty big thing. So many people may be find, finding that this year is not only pivotal in the outside world, but also pivotal for them on their internal world in terms of making major uh, changes of directions in their lives and committing to the course. So if you weren't sure what you... If you weren't sure what you wanted to be when you grew up, this may be the year when it finally becomes crystal clear what direction you need to head in, even if you don't know what you're going to be when you grow up, when you get there. But you'll at least have a really clear idea about how and you need to get there and which direction you got to go in. So there is that. Mm -hmm. Now, the month is starting out under the shadow of an eclipse. Um, so that's always a weird wobbly time right there kind of being suspended in limbo sort of thing and we're all kind of feeling like it's not really it's not really real real right so we're literally kind of like we're not only between the holidays we're between the eclipses so it's a just kind of a time of almost uh, sus internal suspension right so the engine is going but the wheels aren't turning now while that's happening what we are also dealing with which is a positive thing is going to be I can get this here. There we go. Uranus trining all those Capricorn planets, right? But more specifically, Uranus trining Mercury and Jupiter. So what this means for a lot of people is that you may find uh, that if you were needing a lucky break or some type of opportunity, or you needed literally a, a, the oh my gosh, you needed the boulder to get out of your way because there was no way around it or through it. Uh, this first first couple of weeks of the month may be the time when literally something breaks wide open for you and you're finally able to push past and get through this thing that's been kind of jamming you up for a while. So breakthroughs are always welcome things. And with this Uranus trining Mercury Jupiter, lucky breaks and breakthroughs may be the order of the day. So keep an eye out for that and have confidence that if it's meant to happen now it's definitely going to happen now and it may come here's the best part it may come completely out of the blue and from a direction source or through an agent that you could have not possibly predicted which is even better so these are the kind of surprises we like because they're good surprises so there's that <laughs> now as we're doing this mars will begin entering sagittarius giving us um Oh my God, giving us a, a much more happy, go lucky, better humored sense of purpose. So prior to now, all through December, we have Mars and Scorpio, right? Mars and its ruler in Scorpio. And Mars in its rulership in Scorpio is a, should be a good thing, except that, you know, Mars is a war sign and, and Mars is very much about, you know, getting it done, rah, brute strength and all that sort of stuff, right? Scorpio is a dense, dark, secretive, Plutonian sign. There's nothing happy-go-lucky about Scorpio. And when you get Mars, Scorpio's secondary ruler, back at home in its own sign, this is like inviting Darth Vader back to the Death Star. I mean, clearly Darth Vader serves a purpose. <laughs> But once he's at home in his own Death Star, like just the, he is so much more powerful for good or evil, whatever he chooses to do. And we've had a lot of that through December. So there's been a whole lot of 
power mongering and power plays and people just playing devil's advocate to play devil's advocate and also a whole lot of um, well, I hate to say it, but, you know, Shakespearean level revenge and vindictiveness, you know, motifs going on. It's been, it's, it, December's been um, an intense month. Come January, even though we've got this huge lineup and it's approaching exact Saturn Pluto square, Mars going to Sagittarius is going to lighten a lot of this and give us a break, a much needed break, and at least give us the opportunity to get our sense of humor back. And believe me, if you don't leave home without anything else, your sense of humor is the most important thing you can take with you. Okay, and what else do we got here? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, and here's the juiciest part of the month. Here is the juiciest part of the month for everybody. So Venus is going to be changing signs. It's going to move from Aquarius, which is a Saturnine sign, that heavy Saturn emphasis this month, and move into Pisces, which is very Neptune. So the interesting thing about it is that Venus will be in the Venus decanate of Aquarius. So your decanates are the thirds of the sign, uh, 10, 0 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30. It gets break, broken up into thirds. So the last third of Aquarius is Venus ruled. So Venus is back in its Venus ruled decanate in the sign of Aquarius. This is a very social placement. Venus decanate, the last third of Aquarius, is a very social, sociable placement. Um, and typically, Aquarians born in those last 10 degrees of Aquarius are much more uh, social people persons than their other Aquarian counterparts. <laughs> So with Venus here, we're, we're bringing in the month on a very social, friendly level. So lots of positive vibes are happening at this time, which is excellent because as soon as we start the month, not a couple days in, Mars shifts from Scorpio, oh, Scorpio, Scorpio, into happy-go-lucky Sagittarius and clowns and comedy will rule the day. Um, and optimism. <laughs> and optimism. Now, as Venus moves through here, it's, a, it's at some point about the middle of the month, like around the 14th, it's going to change signs and go into Pisces, which Venus loves being in Pisces. So Venus being in Pisces is a great placement for it. And in the first decanate of Pisces, it's a Neptune decanate. So not only do we have Neptune in its own sign by transit, we're also going to have Venus moving into its own sign of exaltation, Pisces, in the Neptune decanate. So we've got a heavy Neptune emphasis happening, also involving this happy-go-lucky Mars. The two together, so the first two-thirds of the month, we're looking at uh, uh, a lightening, lightening of our burdens and feeling like we can, we can do this, we can do this, we can make some progress and get going in our lives. The other thing is it's going to make us much more amiable and pleasant and want to be more amiable, amiable and pleasant and get us out and around people. Um, for those of you who are of the adult variety, this is a very, very sexy, flirtatious time. So for those of you who are not dating or looking to date or can't date because you're otherwise committed, um, this may also be a time when you find yourself more drawn to and enjoying things like romantic comedies or romance novels or, you know, things that kind of give you this thing about happily ever after sort of endings. And, you know, whether they play out like that in real life or not doesn't really matter. It's the inspiration and the feel goods from it that we're looking for and that we're going to pursue during this time. Now, in the last third of the month, Venus will transition over into the moon decanate of its sign, which is going to make us much more, um, much more feely, touchy feely, and uh, all about the feels, right? And Mars will continue its square with Venus, or rather, its approaching square with Venus at this time. So, uh, word to the wise: you may be feeling like this is the the one, the one true one, and they may very well be. I'm not saying they're not. Um, but what I am saying is that for those of you who are a little love hungry, uh, you may be seeing more than is actually there. So try to um, keep your hands to yourself <laughs> until we get through uh, this eclipse at the beginning of the month. So the eclipse will take effect on the 11th, uh, 10th or 11th. You were feeling it for a couple of days before and after this. Um, once we get to about the 15th of the month, 
we're going to be much better off because we'll be out from underneath the more destabilizing effects of the eclipse. So we're going to be on much more solid ground in terms of starting projects and relationships. So if you can cool your jets until about the 15th or so before you really make decisions about whether you want to move forward with a relationship with somebody or a major project, this is the time to do it. Now, I put this in here because I thought this is interesting. I don't know what is going to happen, but my spidey sense tells me that on January 11th, 2020, between the hours of 1.30 and 3.30, specifically 2.30 p.m. Now, this is all based on Easter Standard Time, so I set this up for Washington, D.C., but you can adjust this time to wherever you're at. I think something significant is going to happen, and I don't know what it is. <laughs> at this time, what we are looking at At this time, what we would be looking at is the Sun, Saturn, Pluto, and Mercury, although Mercury is going to be a little wide, right? All conjunct. And we're going to have Regal, 17 Gemini, rising on the chart over DC. And again, you can adjust this for your time zone to see what comes up or what the equivalent of 2.30 p.m. would be around your area, like 1.30 to 3.30. Um, but I'm wondering, so this is our big uh, guessing game for the month, right? We're all learning astrology as we go along. <laughs> um, I think there may be something significant happening around that time on that day. So let's see what happens and if anything actually plays out with that. Now, um, with that said, la 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 with, oh sorry, excuse, excuse, so disregard these, these little part of fortunes and Senate Midhavens, because we can't actually use them here, and that's not what this chart is for. Um, so, let's see what happens and see what plays out, but that's, that's my, um, that's our game for today. Now, the other thing too, I just wanted to point out, so it's very difficult to make predictions and say, oh, this is absolutely going to happen. It's kind of the equivalent of trying to tell people what their future profession is going to be. And the reason that it's difficult is because there's so many things that have not come into existence yet. There's no way for us to know that. Like even Nostradamus was seeing things that he couldn't explain because such a thing didn't exist in his time. He didn't have a frame of reference for it. So when we talk about work, for example, or careers, it's very like if you had asked an astrologer 50 years ago, like what your career was going to be and you're a com computer software security software programmer, there's no way they could have adequately explained or described what your job is because computers didn't even exist, right? Much less security software. So it's the same thing, like we can see things in a chart, but as far as pinpointing exactly what these things are, sometimes it's difficult to give a name to it because it hasn't come into existence yet. You can't describe what you've never seen. So with that said, also with predictions like this, like this, this mystery date, January 11th, 2020, um, it, this becomes a bit of a guessing game as well, because in this particular case, it's not that these things don't exist, although that may be part of why we were not able to pinpoint it. But the other is, that there are so many different possible combinations of things as far as a physical manifestation that come under the rulerships of the sign and the planets. We could literally be here all day making lists, literally all day making lists upon lists upon lists of possible things this could represent. What we do know is that with this particular occurrence, the sun will be activating or spotlighting the Saturn Pluto in a big way. Also remember, the sun rules leadership, kings, royalty, government, heads of state, leadership. That's the sun. Saturn and Pluto, Saturn represents rules and social order and convention and conformity. Pluto rules protesters, anarchists, activists. Uh, big business, big money, big banks, the underworld, criminal elements, antisocial things. 
Ooh, that's a big pot right there, right? So trying to put those three things together, we may see a huge, um, uh, not a conflagration, but like an exclamation point at the end of a sentence being put on things that have to do with governments and leadership and control and power, because Saturn is control and Pluto is power. Mercury being near those degrees also could possibly involve things that have to do with communication, youth, because Mercury rules young people, um, information, data, servants, uh, civil and domestic, right? Um, and also travel, like the vehicle, vehicle, vehicle. <laughs> vehicles, planes, trains, and automobiles. So all of these things together combined, we should see some emphasis in that or in some other thing that's from that list of keywords that come with these plants. So I'm sorry I don't have, um, and the fixed star of course emphasizes this. So I'm sorry I don't have a more specific prediction for you. I am not Nostradamus, um, but I will say that looks like an interesting moment in time. So let's see what actually comes from that. Hmm? All right. And to recap, we've got some major stuff happening this month um, that's really going to change the course of the future. And this is especially true if you are uh, Great Britain or England, and I am looking at the correct mundane chart for the country. Um, the year is going to start off on in the external world. It's going to be colorful. Uh, but on a personal level, we're all going to get down to what really matters in our lives, which is really about our relationships and our, our feelings and the feelings of the people around us and being able to find those feel good moments, you know, between the fires that we're putting out <laughs> and disasters we're trying to avoid. Because at the end of the day, it's not out there that's important. It's what's in here, right? Inside us, inside our relationships, inside our homes. Those are the things that really matter. And if those things are not happy and healthy, then nothing out there is going to fix or help that or, or compensate for it. January 10th or 11th, we've got the eclipse. This should say 20 cancer, by the way. I apologize. That's a bit of a typo. So we have the eclipse at 20 cancer, which is conjunct the fixed star caster, um, which is a very uh, pugilistic <laughs> pugilistic fixed star it's a combative fixed star uranus will also be stationing direct on that day at two taurus uh, this particular eclipse we definitely want to keep an eye on uh, things that are happening in great britain i have not done boris johnson's chart i will get around to it but i suspect this may have more to do with the the, the nation of england rather than him specifically um, between January 6th and January 23rd, which is pretty much the entire month, we are looking at Saturn being in partile, and that's astro speak for nearly exact to exact, Saturn partile conjunction to Pluto. So Saturn's going to be within one degree of that Pluto or exactly on it almost the entire month of January. So if we really want to see what control and power looks like when they get married to each other, we're going to see it in its glory this month, because that will be the big, overwhelming, dominant, which is also Saturn-Pluto dominating, um, dominant conversation and overarching theme we're all globally going to have to deal with. So it's literally um, the, the stop maintaining the status quo versus the destruction of the status quo. So there's a lot of uh, conflict right there. Um, so we'll see what happens. Hong Kong may be a prescient sort of preview of what the rest of us are going to deal with. Um, anyway, anyway, okay. Um, also January 12th to 14th. Now we'll have a sun Mercury conjunct that Saturn Pluto conjunction as Venus is changing signs to Pisces. So, uh, this, so this may seem like an awful, awful thing, but the reality is this particular combination of Sun Mercury on top of Saturn Pluto absolutely gives us the, and with Venus going to Pisces, gives us the opportunity to get in and unhook those flaming train cars that are destroying our lives. So if you're interested or able or desirous of doing the internal work and really getting out of your own way that is what it comes down to getting out of your own way so that you can have a happy fulfilled loving life and isn't that really what it's about january 12th to 14th will offer you the opportunity to have an epiphany of huge magnitude that may very well be the one the key that unlocks the lock that finally 
allows you to put some stuff to rest, you know, and uh, solve the mystery of why you can't get what you want or get where you want to be. All right, days to watch, January 2nd and January 17th. I'm not going to tell you why. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you you need to watch. And also January 11th, don't forget that day. And that's it. And then we get to the end of the month. And uh, if we're still here and you're revisiting this video at the end of the month to see what was said and how it's correlating with what played out over the month, well, honey, we made it. So it's only downhill from here. It's all easy from here until we get to the second half of the year. So make hay while the sun shines and get your work done as best you can. And to all of you, a big thank you. Um, please remember to like, subscribe, and share to support the channel. Um, I do, because the YouTube algorithms and what they've done, I don't show up on a lot of the feeds and stuff because I don't have enough subscribers. So apparently it's a positive feedback system. So the more subscribers you have, the more frequently you appear in browse and search engines. Um, so for everybody on YouTube who's not working at 26 billion subscribers, it's a bit of a challenge to get up and be visible. So your support matters a lot. Um, if you're on Twitter, you can find me occasionally sending up smoke signals <laughs> and distress flares um, and little astro reports uh, on Destiny and Fate 2. That's the number two, Destiny and Fate, numeral two. Um, you can reach me by email at primalworldwellness at gmail.com and the podcast, as soon as I figure out how to do it, we're getting a podcast. So for those of you who can't watch videos on the go, because it's too much data download, we'll be converting all of this over to audio so you can listen to it as part of a podcast while you're out doing your thing. <laughs>